Today's lesson is on a pedigree. A pedigree is a basically a family tree um, in a pictorial way. We're going to show how family members are related. And, but in a pedigree, in science, they use it for the tracing of a particular trait. Now that trait could be a disorder, or that trait could be anything from having attached ear lobes. So I'm going to show you how they organize a pedigree so that other people can interpret it, and you can communicate your information effectively. It's a bunch of symbols, and two very basic symbols that they start with that you would need to know is the idea that a circle represents a female, a square represents a male. To show that it, they have mated or married, they can draw a, or a horizontal line that connects them just like that. To show that they have children, you take a vertical line from the mating line or marriage line and drop that down vertically. And then what you would draw is a sibling line. And that can vary. Um, I can say that they had a daughter. Let's draw a son there. And a daughter. So this is a family of five where a mother and father had three children. This can get more intricate and bigger and bigger, and we'll do add some more things, like, for example, say that this son got married, or sorry, this, yeah, so this daughter got married, they also had a daughter, so you can say that this daughter is the grandchild of these grandparents, all right? And there's other things, so say that he had his own family, had a sister, so you kind of build a pedigree, it's just recognizing how they are related. So what we would say is that for this pedigree, we identified this as the first generation, so we put a Roman numeral one, that would be these four individuals as the first generation, or the parents. The second generation, followed by we have one person in the third generation. There are other symbols that kind of get uh, more detailed, and if they ever come up, we'll talk about them, but I don't need to overwhelm this video with all the different exceptions to rules. This will get you through 95% of pedigrees. So this just shows relationships. It doesn't show a trait. So what we do is to show that one person has a different phenotype than the other, what we can do is we can shade in So I'm going to shade in some of the people here. So what that says is shaded people on this pedigree have a similar trait. They have a similar phenotype. And we can kind of make up a phenotype as we do this. That means that the unshaded people, um, they would have the other phenotype. They often say that the shaded person is the affected person. So if we're looking for people that are, you know, have a particular disorder, you would say that the four people that are shaded here suffer or have that particular disorder, whether it's diabetes, things like that. Or it could be as simple as, you know, the affected person, we really are looking for people that have attached earlobes. So it doesn't have to be a necessarily disease for a pedigree. But we can say that these four people have attached earlobes. That would then automatically deduce that the other um, six people that are unshaded, or what they call unaffected, so there's different ways you can kind of talk about it, not shaded. You know, I tend to go between both of them, and we'll say affected and unaffected. So from this, I can get that information. I can, I can see that four people are affected by whatever trait, and let's just say, for example, that we are looking at um, attached earlobes. So those four people have attached earlobes. Here, 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 and here. The purpose of this is now to figure out, using the shading pattern, what is the mode of inheritance? So we can have modes of inheritance such as autosomal, which means that the gene is found in an autosome. Males and females have the same amount or same number of copies for autosomes. Every male and every female has two copies of every gene that is found in an autosome. Or the other mode of inheritance could be sex-linked. And we have learned that sex-linked most often deals with genes that are found on the X chromosome. Males only have one copy of that. Females would have two copies. So there is a distinction there for sex-linked. Then you have within each of those a dominant and recessive version. 
So we look at the pattern and we try and figure out what is the most likely mode of inheritance based on the shading pattern that you see. So what I do is it's kind of a trial and error thing. You plug in a particular genotype. You can use a variable of your choice or allele of your choice. I often start with A. So if I start plugging this in, I start looking for things that wouldn't really work. So say, for example, I'm trying to predict is the unshaded or unaffected person, do they have the recessive trait or the dominant trait? So let's look at them. They are both unaffected, but they have an affected child. So if you were to assume that these two parents had a recessive phenotype, is it possible for them to have a shaded person, which would mean that they have affected, which would say it had to be the opposite or dominant. That's not possible. So I can kind of deduce that the shaded person can't be a dominant phenotype due to the fact that these two parents would then have to be recessive. So what we do is we kind of start plugging in variables or alleles. So if I think that this is autosomal, which means males and females both get two copies of the gene, that would then mean everybody that is shaded would have an identical genotype. They all have the recessive phenotype. So what does that tell you about everybody that has the unaffected phenotype, or in this case, the unattached earlobes. Because they're unshaded, if shaded means recessive, that would mean these would have a dominant. But unfortunately with dominant phenotypes, we don't really know what the second allele is. So what I'm going to do right now is just plug in the first letter that we know they must have. Then we use the other things around the, the pedigree to try and fill in what must the second letter be if it's available? So I look at this child and say, if this child has two recessive A's, this one could have been donated from the father. But that would then mean that this one had to come from mother. And if the mother doesn't show it, that means she must have it there for it to be passed on. So we can fill that one in. Then we look at this son. So he has a dominant A. Where did he get it from? He had to get that from mom because dad doesn't have a recessive A, or sorry, he doesn't have a dominant A. So therefore, a recessive A, every time this father has a child, must pass down a recessive A. So he must be heterozygous. We look then at the next one. Is there any clue that gives us what this second allele must be? Well, we look to their child. Again, it's a recessive variation a recessive, one had to come from mom, one had to come from dad. There is the one that came from dad. The other one is not shown, so that must be recessive. Then we look over here, and we say, these, these parents, they had a child that was homozygous recessive. Both had to pass on a recessive, so they both must have a recessive. Then we look at this child. If you cross a heterozygous with a heterozygous, there is an opportunity for have a homozygous or a heterozygous. There is no way to guarantee what allele that female inherited. She doesn't have children to kind of see if she had a recessive to pass on. There's no guarantee that a parent passed on a recessive to her. So how do we indicate that we've looked at this and we really can't tell that it's homozygous or heterozygous? I generally put a slash and dash and what that means is there is an opportunity for that person to be homozygous dominant or heterozygous. So what you start to do is you're going to start seeing, <coughs> excuse me, seeing many of these pedigrees and you'll look for basic patterns and you'll start eliminating choices of inheritance and then you can decide that this pedigree, the affected person has a recessive trait and then you start filling in genotypes of all the others. So what we can do is let's do another example of a pedigree. Let's do an autosomal dominant pedigree. That means that the affected people in the pedigree would have exhibiting a, a dominant trait. It would be autosomal, so therefore all males and females would have two copies of the gene. We'll get to what it would look like if it was sex-linked. Autosomal dominant.
All right. So here's an example of a pedigree that can be classified as autosomal dominant. One thing that you don't look for is just pure numbers. You can't identify something that is dominant just based on numbers. You can easily get suckered into, um, unfortunately, wrong answers. You've got to prove it with alleles. So what we do here is let's prove that this is an autosomal dominant. So what that means is anybody that is affected by a trait would have a dominant allele. Again, it is autosomal, so that means everybody is going to have two copies of this, this A gene. As soon as you know that this would be dominant, that would mean that the unaffected people must have the recessive trait. So I can pretty much go in immediately. That's kind of a giveaway to you that if they have a recessive phenotype, only recessive phenotypes have one matching genotype, so they are homozygous recessive. Now let's try and fill in as many of the other letters that follow the dominant A's as possible. So I look to this parent and see that every time this parent has a child, a dominant or a recessive A must be passed on. So that would mean that this female must have a recessive, this female must have a recessive. What about this father? Well, if they had a child that was homozygous recessive, again, you can't get both recessives from the mom. One came from mom, one came from dad. Then we look over here and we would say that, all right, this child right here is homozygous recessive. One came from dad, the other had to come from mom so that she better have a recessive. Then we look at these two children. There is no way to determine this due to the fact that there is a possibility that these could be dominant, dominant, or dominant recessive. So therefore they are slash and dash. So that works perfectly. If someone tried to fill this pedigree in as the affected people have a recessive phenotype, we're going to show you why that would work. This is why it proves. So if you go in here and I said, hypothetically speaking, a person thought they had to make this, this judgment, say, what is the inheritance pattern of this pedigree? And they're thinking, well, maybe it's recessive. So that would mean that all these people would be homozygous recessive and all the unshaded would have a dominant. So we look at this pedigree and say, is it even possible for that to happen? And what's not possible is this relationship right here. Two parents that are both homozygous recessive cannot have a child that has a dominant phenotype. So therefore, that rules this out. And that's what you have to kind of do. You're going to be plugging in alleles because you have to guess you have to figure out what the inheritance pattern is. It's not given to you. So that's something that we're going to be working on. Um, I showed you one recessive that's autosomal, and here's one that is um, autosomal dominant. So this is kind of the, the strategy you're going to be looking for. You plug in some alleles and see, is there any patterns that are shaded and unshaded that wouldn't work within a Punnett square?